Everlasting Father, who does all things perfectly, has lengthened out the fragile threads of our lives and caused our precious moments to continue on for just a little bit longer. And for that, each of us ought to be truly grateful to God. I want to start off by saying it's so good to see so many of you here. After the episode on last evening, it was questionable if you might come back. <laughs> I, the reason I say that, uh, the person who was uh, supposed to tell me when I was supposed to step down forgot to tell me, and I went uh, completely on and off and everything else, and instead of stopping in about 45 minutes, I don't know what happened, but I just kept on going. <laughs> So I apologize to you for taking away from your time and uh, keeping you longer than I had anticipated or had expected. But we're grateful that we're here together here this evening. And I want to also share with you, my wife had to uh, bring something to my attention that uh, she said that I was sweating profusely quite a bit and I hadn't sweat like that since I've been away. Uh, and yet I've only been out of the pool pit three weeks the entire time I've been gone and I've been gone for three years. But the thing that uh, is different is simply this. We have a deep love for this place. Yeah. And it's urgent that we understand how important it is to do God's will now, yeah. present tense, and henceforth in the future. So when I look at you and I think about the things we've gone through and the things we've experienced together, it causes a deeper relationship to develop. And when people say that uh, they can say this, but I know this. When people say that your brothers and sisters in Christ are actually closer to you after you become a Christian and work in the vineyard a while, are actually closer to you than your biological kin. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I can say that with, uh, with truth and no mental reservations in my heart whatsoever. I have new mothers, I have new grandmothers, I've got all kinds of grandchildren and children, and I have to say that with some qualifications in the truth and in the spirit, okay? So I want you to know you're a family to us. My wife has really never left here. She, she told me the other day I should have just sat over in that corner and watched uh, uh, Brother Mark preach and just coached him and just, we just stayed here. Then we wouldn't have had to do all this. And she's now trying to make re uh, some kind of plans to come back, so I tell you, <laughs> she certainly didn't want me to tell you that but that is the truth that is the truth I thank God for you I just want to let you know that before I get into this uh, subject for this evening what will you leave behind what will you leave behind what will it be that you leave behind to be remembered for what will you be remembered for in this this city in this congregation or in your own personal home congregation, what will you be remembered for? Objectively speaking, the source of strength is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, church. We all understand that. In particular, it is found in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Discipleship is what God's Son calls for. If you look at the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 20, he says, go into all the world and make disciples, disciples, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then he says, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But let's go back. Go into all the world and make disciples. And for so long we've been focused on the church, we failed to focus on discipleship. Because discipleship is key to the health and the survival of the church. I'm so grateful to see one of our senior and seasoned preachers, and Brother Wash McCall sitting here with Sister McCall by his side. I'm going to use you in a minute, so hold on. Is that all right? I got permission. When you look together with me in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, hope you brought your own personal copy of the Bible. I do not claim that I have attained anything, and I'm certainly not perfect. I encourage you to study behind everything I say to make sure that you yourself know I told you the truth. 
I am responsible, according to the book of First Timothy, Thessalonians, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 21, to prove all things, and we'll hold fast to that which is good. When we look at this text, and let's look at it closely, what it is saying to us. Second Timothy chapter 2, let's start with verse number 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things, watch this church, and the things that you, Timothy, have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful, you see M-E-N? Yes. Is that in your Bible? That's right. Men, that word is anthropos, that includes women. That's right. Are y'all listening? Yes. That includes women, and we're going to try to clarify that as we go. Ladies are involved. Who will be able to do what? Teach others also. So we are supposed to leave our legacy through our teaching. We share the gospel with others. Discipleship is a picture of one that is of a strong teacher. A strong teacher has two very basic qualities. A strong teacher receives the truth. And they receive a changed life, a transformation of life so dramatic that they became as new men and new creatures. Amen. They received a deep sense of God's presence. And they received the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit as we spoke on yesterday and day before about. They received the assurance of living forever. Witness after witness down through the centuries confirm the truth of this. What does it mean in the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse number 17 where it speaks to us? Would you read that for me please? Romans chapter 1 verse number 17 that at the mouth of two or more witnesses may everything be established. And the reading of the text will help us with this. For therein, therein is the righteousness of God is the, revealed. Is the righteousness of God revealed. He's talking about the gospel. Go ahead. From faith to faith. From faith to faith. As from teacher is, to student. From faith to faith. From the, end of your, from the beginning of your faith to the end of your faith, you are supposed to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that you can pass it on. You are not in a Bible class just to sit there week after week to give your attendance as a spectator. You are there with a purpose. That's right. God has a purpose for everyone that has been saved by his son's blood. And your purpose is to glorify him wherever you may go, which means lifting him up, lifting him up in your life. You don't always have to teach because when you look at what Paul, I'm sorry, Peter told the wife who was having trouble with her husband who wouldn't obey, she said, he told her, he said, what you do, sister, is don't talk so much to him, and I'm paraphrasing, don't talk so much to him, just live a proper example before him in the spirit of fear and of discipline so he can come around from looking at your chaste behavior. In other words, you live it so somebody will be inspired by you. You don't come to church just to say, I went. Amen. I went to church today. What did you get? Now watch this. The devil beats us up sometimes. You remember when Jesus said, when the sower went out and sowed the seed? Yes. And some of it fell by the wayside. You remember what happened to the seed that fell by the wayside? The birds got it, did it not? Is that correct? Amen, y'all. Hello. I know y'all know the story of the parable of the sower because just about every preacher that's ever preached has preached on it. When the bird comes by, he picks it up so that it doesn't have a chance to germinate. It doesn't have a chance to mature. It doesn't have a chance to do anything. And sometimes when you get a good sermon at church and your preacher just really comes down and sows the word of God, you'll find out that sometime before you get out of this building, he took it right out of your heart. You're talking about everything from where you're going to eat from where you, to where you're going tomorrow and what you're going to do tomorrow night. Yes. But you're not talking about the word that just got planted in your heart. Yes. Because the enemy's not going to let it stay there that long because he don't want you to think about it too long. Because you might be convinced if it stays there too long. You have purpose, church. Amen. You're not just in here to save yourself. you got other people that are not saved. Don't be selfish. Be selfless. So that others will have the blessing that you've been blessed to receive. Have you not been blessed, church? 
The church ought to be as happy as anybody in the world since the fruit of the Spirit is not only just love, joy, joy, and you ought to have some peace. Because it's not just one part of the Spirit that you have, you have all of it. You see, some people major in one or two parts and leave the other parts out. But I don't believe in that. I believe you should have every bit of it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faithfulness. All of that is a part of the fruit. Every bit of it. And it's singular because it's only one spirit. So all of you have that. And you all have that for a purpose. You are in that purpose to learn how to love like Jesus loved you. This has to be learned. You have to learn how to forgive like Jesus forgave you. This has to be learned. We have to learn how to recognize we're not the judge. We're not the jury. And we're certainly not the executioner. Some things we got to leave for God. I'm going to start this like I did last night. There is the judge. There is a judge. I'd like to identify him for you so you'll understand who he is. Look with me in the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse number 31. And it says, watch this. And this is, this right here is objectivity. This is not subjectivity. Subjectivity would be my opinion of the thing. This is objectivity. This is who the judge is objectively from the word of God. God, look at that. God has appointed a day in the which he will judge how much? In by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof the assurance is given to all, that's anthropos, men and women. He has given it unto all men. In that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the assurance that Jesus Christ is the only one truly, truly worthy of judging us. Now the rest of us are going to be judged. Now what should the rest of us be doing? I said this last night. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. I'm sorry, 14 and verse number 11. Romans chapter 14, verse number 11. For it is written, watch this, as I live, says the Lord. Where is it coming from? God. This is objective. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to who? So then each of us shall give a what? Of himself to who? Therefore, let us not, let us not, let us not one another anymore. But rather what? Not to put or a in our You're supposed to be watching what you do, watching how you walk, watching how you talk, watching how you live, because you are a living epistle known and read by men. Somebody's getting a message from you wherever you go, at work, at play, or at home in the closet. You are giving out messages. And God said, I want you to make sure that message don't cause somebody else to stumble and fall and lose their way. That's what the church is supposed to be about. That's the reason Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 5 said that we ought to examine each other. Let's go over there and read it. Let's go get an objective point of view. Let's see if he said that we should examine each other, Brother McCall. Let's get down here and examine each other. If that's what it calls for, let me have some word from that. Let Read that, please. Examine yourself. Examine the world. Examine the other members, especially the worst ones in the congregation. Let's go. Read on, please. Examine yourselves. Examine whether, yourself. Whether you. Whether you. Be in the faith. Be in the faith. Because sometimes we may not be walking by faith. We may be walking by sight. We see things and it causes us to react. And from that reaction, we cause, sometimes think we are in a position, because we've lived right for about a couple of weeks, to call the shot on somebody else. Amen. But I'm here right. to tell you, I've lived long enough to know this. If you live long enough, if you've made it two weeks, you'd be uh, hard pressed to make three. Because the enemy is not going to leave you alone too long. Amen. So hold your judgment back. That's right. Well, Brother Hogan, what are we supposed to do? I'll do what Jesus said. A tree is known by its fruit. I'm a fruit inspector. I can inspect it. I don't judge it, but I can look at it. I'll know what I'm looking at. Because God's word helps me to discern it. It helps me to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
No, I'm not a mystic. No, I'm not reading minds. But I know what I'm looking at. And I know when somebody has been taught by God and when they've just kind of been sitting there looking at other people. Because when a little bit of pressure comes along, what's in you is going to come out. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Attitudes are formed, shaped from inside. That's the reason you have to protect this. Guard your heart. Helmet of salvation. Protect it. Protect it. Guard it and equip it. The Bible said that David long ago said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not against thee. God said, I want to put my word in your heart. He said it in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. I'm not going to write it on stone anymore. I'm going to be putting it in your heart. That's the reason you have to come to Bible school because there's no such thing as osmosis in Christianity. You don't just run through here and it jumps on you and sticks to you. No, it doesn't do that. You have to put it in here. The Bible says study to show me approved. Study to show them approved. Study to show who approved. It didn't say study to show somebody how much you know. It says study to show yourself approved to who? See, that didn't tell you to show out. It just said learn who you are. And when you look in the perfect law of liberty, you can't jump too high too often. Because now you're looking at you through the lenses of God and you see what God sees in you. And when you look at you sometimes, you've got to say, Lord, please have mercy on me. You're like that man that was up there with that Pharisee who was bragging on himself. You understand after looking in the law of liberty, you ought to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I beg your grace. I beg your mercy. And when you go down like that, God will lift you up. God lifted that man up that day. God said that man went home justified rather than the other. Church, we have a lot of things we're wrestling with, issues. And it's because we're wrestling with them that it tells me we need to be closer to our study. We need to be supporting our Bible schools. We need to be supporting the study and the teaching of God's word. We need to be there. I know that Brother Wash calls for the Bible study. I know Brother McLean calls for it. I don't even have to ask these preachers. I know Brother, uh, 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 Brother Parker calls for it. I know Brother Strong calls for it. I know they call for it. But you see, we have to recognize we are identified by God as what? Sheep? Are we sheep? That's an, I know that's a, it's a metaphor for it. I know what we're talking about. He's using that to identify that we are willing to follow. Sheep follow their shepherd tirelessly. And the shepherd is so unique because he knows each one of them by name. So he knows when they're not in his company. We are as sheep. That means we follow the shepherd. And when you become aware of the truth, go with me to Psalms chapter 21, verse uh, 23, I'm sorry, 23, verse 1. What does it say in Psalms 23, verse 1? When you see this, you will stop missing Bible class if you can get a good understanding of this. If you see this, you're going to give up on some of that missing Bible class stuff and stop making all them old ugly excuses that you keep making up that satisfy only you. The God Lord, has never been satisfied with your excuses. Let me say that first. The Lord is my shepherd. He's whose shepherd? Is my shepherd. Now, wait a minute, David. You're not the only sheep in this flock. But the relationship between David and this shepherd That's right. is that personal. Amen. Intimate. That's it's that close. I don't want to be far away from my shepherd. He protects me. He leads me. He makes me to lie down where I need to lie down. He, he guards. He does everything that I need. He is my personal shepherd. I know he's yours too, but he's my personal. I don't want to be anywhere except around him. Why do you say that, Brother Hogan? That's why we want to go to heaven. Now, where he is, we want to be also. Is that right? We can't be there if we act like we don't want to be there here. Now, you go to Colossians chapter 1, and verse number 13. The word of God still says, he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. He put us in there so we'd always be with him. 
He made a promise to us before he left. He said, I'm going away and I'm going to prepare a place that where I am, where I am, ye may be also. Stop reading that at only funerals. Read that in the morning. Read that in the evening. Where I am, you may be also. I'm going to a place and I'm going to prepare it for you. I'm going to prepare it for those of you who are prepared. I'm coming back. And I'm coming back for you. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Ain't nobody going to be in heaven that don't want to be there. Amen. Amen, Brother Hogan. So if you don't want to go to heaven now, you're not going to go later either. Because your judgment is being made now. You say, well, how do you know that? Because the Bible still says it's appointed unto man once to die, and then what? You've been to enough funerals to know. When you take that last breath, your whole record goes in. That's what you're going to be judged by. Not what you did 95 years ago, but what you're doing today. Where are you today? Because, see, God puts us through some things so he can get some things out of us. He puts us in fire. To get some things out of us so he can use us more effectively because he can't use us with some of the garbage we carry sometimes. Have you ever noticed sometimes when you go to the airport, people got all them bags they're dragging around? But they're going somewhere, you know. What are we doing when we're dragging our baggage from last year around? This got in there an uh, attitude against somebody who uh, crossed me on Sunday, backed into my car on Wednesday. Sent me a letter without the name on it, and I know who sent it. I'm dragging all that around with me all the time. And if I keep dragging that around, you, you know it affects my heart. The next thing you know, I start acting on what I've got in my heart. And then when somebody like Brother Halo comes up to me and says, How you doing, Brother Hogan? And I give him a few superlatives. And she said, Where'd that come from? I just said hello to you. Well, all this baggage I got here is stored up, and it's all swole up in there, and it just blows up. You become victim of circumstance. You the, I'm not the one. You, you didn't hurt my feelings. He did. But you're going to get the brunt. Because what? I haven't let it go. These are teachings. These are lessons. Now, what will you be remembered for? There are some of you who remember your Bible school teachers from years ago. Amen. Sister Winston used to teach you. Am I right? Amen. You remember those things? You used to go to a Bible class and they'd take care of you just like you were their own. They were teaching. My wife has taught classes where the little girls have grown up and they still remember Sister Hogan and the teaching. And they still have regard for them. They remember that they were taught by someone who loved them. They remember that, and as they grow up, they begin to nurture that. And as time goes on, they want to be like somebody. Somebody that took time with them and loved them and made an impression upon them. Somebody that was truly committed to the Lord. Yes. Somebody who loved the Lord enough to get hit by the enemy, get up and still keep coming back. Amen. You see, it's one thing to be a preacher. It's another thing to be a preacher who's gone through something. So when them look, I got a preacher now. I've been, well, I'm not going to go into that. Anyway, sometimes when you're teaching preachers and they just got out of school, they're smart. Boy, they're smart. They're just razor sharp. Quote scripture, just blazing, just like your computer, just laser. They quote it, quote it, quote it. But they ain't never lived it. And then when they get down in the muck and mire and they start finding that this stuff smells and this stuff is tough and people's attitudes are at best certifiable at times. And they start saying, what kind of people? I thought these were Christian. Thought a lot. You think a little more. You're going to learn some more. Keep on going. Will you hang after this? I've had preachers come to me and say, I'm not going to preach. No, I ain't got to go through that. I ain't, I ain't got to put my family through that. But I thought you said you were called. <laughs> you said you was called, and you now, there's your calling. <laughs> Thunder and lightning and bolts flying everywhere in that house. And go on up in there and see what the sons of Sceva went through. <laughs> what I'm saying is, God 
is doing that for the purpose of trying us to see where our commitment truly is. And if you come out of something, sometime you'll see that God has made you a new creature. He made you better. He made you better. He's still making us better. We're in the healing stage here in Cleveland. We're healing. Thank God we're healing. Healing. Healthy, spiritual healing. Thank God for that. You ought to be happy. You ought to be happy. The devil's not happy, but you ought to be happy. Make the devil mad every now and then, church. Do something for God. Say amen for him every now and again. Raise his hand up every now and again. Stop telling everybody the devil's treating you so bad. Throw him to the side because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Put God on the front burner and show the world who you are. Put him out front and see if the devil don't do what he's always done. Run. But you can't do that if it ain't in here. He'll beat you to death. I saw a horror movie one time, Brother McCall. I, I, people get on my case about me and my horror movies, but they're enjoyable to me. I, I laugh at them. So one time I was watching this movie, and I love vampire movies, obviously. I look at them a lot. A vampire. This little priest was coming in to save this damsel in distress who was about to be bitten and sucked dry by this vampire. And as he came in, he had his little cross. He held his cross up, and the vampire standing there, the woman's right there. She's just, just praying something will help her out of here. He pulled his little cross out and held it up. And the vampire, I love this vampire. The vampire went over, grabbed the cross, crushed it, tossed it, looked at the priest, and said, you got to believe in it for it to work. Ain't no need putting that. And then he whooped down the priest and got the one. Yeah. Ain't no good if you don't believe in it. <laughs> Same thing here. If we don't believe in it, it ain't going to work. <laughs> I want to deal with a very delicate subject. I want you to look at me objectively. I'm not going subjectively because subjectively we can find a lot of opinions on this. I want you to go with me. To Titus chapter 2. What is the work we are supposed to do since women are to teach, men are to teach? Let's look at some things. You hold Titus chapter, uh, did I say Titus, right? Titus chapter 2. Hold that for me. God has an order. Hold Titus, okay? Y'all stay with Titus. Brother Parker, go with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Start just after verse 8. Y'all stay at Titus, okay? Start just after verse 8. I want you to see something. We're going to go from here, okay? Titus, will, uh, go ahead with uh, Timothy, please. Verse 8 says, I will therefore that, I will therefore that men. Now hold it. Aner. The word men there is not anthropos. That's right. It's aner. aner. It means male, yes. masculine, mm -hmm. boy figure. It's not male, female. That's right. Aner means Masculine, male, man. It is making a distinction. Now watch. Go ahead. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Keep going. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Keep going. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Keep going. Not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being, the, being deceived was in the transgression. Now, hold it right there. Notice what Paul just did with Timothy. He started talking about men lifting up holy hands. He's saying, men, I want you to be out front. I want you to lead. I want you to lead the worship. Holy hands to God. He said, I got something for women here, and I'm going to explain to you why I have it for women. 
And he didn't just stay right there. He didn't start talking to them where they were at that day. He went back all the way to the beginning. Did he not? He went back and got Adam and Eve when they were in the garden. And when he got Adam and Eve in the garden, he pointed out something. The woman was talking to a snake. And the snake gave her some directions and some instructions contrary to God's will. And the husband was there somewhere, Brother McCall. I don't know where he was, but he was there somewhere. Because she called him right after she took the notion that she should follow the instruction of the snake. Be careful where you get your instructions from. So he went back to the beginning and said, the woman, they were both equal at that time. Male and female. But one stepped outside of their aura. Their union. She stepped outside, took instructions from a foreigner, a stranger, and she took that instruction from the stranger and brought it into their union. As a result of that, God was totally displeased because after this experience took place, they both discovered they were naked. They were ashamed. They went to hide in the brush or bushes. And they hid because they didn't want God to know. Now listen. From the beginning, they were one. The woman stepped outside of it. And then God says, I'm going to have to change things. My brother, whichever one of you, can you get for me Genesis 3? What kind of Bible is that? Good, I need that. Genesis 3 and verse number 16, please. Some of these Bibles they read, and I, I don't know what language they're in. I don't know where they, they just, I don't, somebody pulled out something the other day, some kind of translation on me. I said, I, I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what that is. I, I really didn't. I didn't. Read for me verse 16, please. Verse 16. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. If you don't get it quick, I'll be up here a long time tonight, too. That's the reason I'm trying to keep it pushing here. Then keep Cain it. went out from the, from the presence of the Lord. They went out from the presence of the Lord. And settled in the land of Nod. Said in the, what are you talking about, man? Uh-uh. What, what version do you say you got? That's like that guy the other day had me out there. What is it? Okay. To the woman, he said. To the woman, he said. We're there. I will greatly multiply. I will greatly multiply the your pain. Go ahead. In childbirth. In childbirth. In pain. In pain. You shall bring forth children. You shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband. Stop right there. Your desire shall be for your husband. He just made a rank and file here. He just gave an order. Yes. He is saying now, your desire shall be to your husband. And read on. And then shall the rule over you. He sh now read it, read it again. Say it again. And he shall rule and over he you. And he shall rule over you. God gave the man the charge. Timothy was told, not by something that was happening that day, but he went back all the way to the beginning and said, God's plan has never changed. But since man and his desire to not obey my will has sinned, I got an order now that's going to have to be recognized and followed from henceforth. All right? Now, when we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2 again, we see that he said, I don't want a woman to usurp authority. You know why he said that? Because that's what Eve did in the garden. She took on herself to step out front and lead the family that she wasn't given authorization to lead. And God said, now from now on, you'll be wanting to do this the rest of your journey. Every woman's going to be wanting to be in the place of the man. You'll be desiring, you'll be reaching for it, you'll be grabbing for it, but it's not yours. I gave this to the man. I also gave him a job, and it's going to be hard, because he listened to you. Are you right? Are you ready? Are y'all ready? 
Now watch this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and also gave himself for it. Look at the order. The standard bearer is the man. This is God's plan. Objectively, this is God's plan. He said, husbands love your wives. The man has the responsibility in the family to set the standard for love in his family. Now you say, well, the woman can love. Yes, she can. But man is the one God gave charge. God did it. God did it. God did it. I want to make sure I understand, we understand that. This is God's house. God's rules. God leads. He said, husbands, if you want your house to be full of love, it's got to come out of you first. And I want you to be just like my son Jesus when you're loving your family. You don't deny them, you don't neglect them, and you don't abuse them. You love them when they're good, you love them when they're nasty, you love them anywhere in between. They're your family. Love them. Husbands, love your wives even as, as Christ. I had somebody in Tennessee jump me a while back and said, well, what if my husband tells me not to come to Sunday school? I said, he ain't Christ. I said, he's not a Christian if he told you that. He's not Christ-like if he told you to disobey his father's will. Because the father said, I want you not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I want you together. I want you to study to show yourself approved unto God. I want you together. Now, you know if he's telling you that, the snake done got in your garden. Watch the snakes because they'll show up every now and then. So if you got a husband telling you not to go to Sunday school, you know why God said be not unequally yoked, don't you? He wasn't trying to keep you out of nothing. He said, some people tell me, God just don't know how much I love this person. Yes, he does. I just got to have Halo. I just got to have Halo. Just got to have Halo. Halo's not in the church. I just love Halo. Halo's so sweet. Ain't nobody in the church. Ain't nobody in the church. Ain't a man in that church nowhere. I love Halo. I got a halo. <laughs> Ain't nobody else in that church but Halo. I mean, Halo's outside the church. Amen. I'm going to get Halo baptized. He's going to be in the church. And then you go on and marry Halo, and six months later you say, Lord, Brother Hogan, please help me. Halo about to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Halo about to kill Well, what else would a sinner do? That's what sinners do. That's why God said, don't get into that. If you'd have waited, somebody else might have showed up, but you just had to have hello. And God told you. God's trying to get us to see something. Do you know women have a lot to do in the church? I'm going to show you how we're going to do this. We're going to do, pop, we're going to do objectively what God has said, okay? Let's look now in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I think you start around verse 3. Really? Okay. You ready? You ready? Come on now. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Somebody give me Titus <laughs> Yeah, yeah, real help. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let's go. The aged women likewise. Go ahead, go ahead. That they in aged women, in mature the women. Young. Hold it. I got to give them their responsibility. Right. Mature women, you have a responsibility. Amen. In God's house. What did he tell the mature women to do? Just read it again, that's all. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh in holiness. They, number one, have to conduct themselves as spiritual, as mature, and as Christian la uh, ladies. Mm -hmm. Okay? Keep reading. Not false accusers. Not false accusers. Not lying. Not given to much wine. Not getting drunk. Teachers of good things. What is that? Do what? What is not, that? Not given to much wine. Uh, yeah, we don't got that. Go Teachers ahead. of good things. Teachers of what? Good things. Of good things. Keep going. That they may teach the young women. That they may teach who? The young women. The young women. To be sober. 
to love their husband, to love their children. Now, let's look at what God gave us here. Now, up to 1949, 1950, a husband and wife got married. The wife would stay at home and take care of the kids. This is a time before some of you know anything about. Some of you are very familiar with it. The husband would go work and the wife would stay home. And she would nurture the children. She would take care of the children. She would school the children. She'd socialize the children. She'd encourage the children in the way that God has instructed her to do it. And the husband would go out and work and make the money and support them fully. But times got difficult. And it got to the point where we ended up having to have our women to go out and work to help support the family. Now by the time a child is six weeks old, we're taking him to the daycare or the nanny or, the de- or some other person who is able to take care of them. But ain't nobody like mama going to take care of her baby like mama. But yet the baby's out there and they're being socialized and they're learning to work in the, walk in the world before they even get the first grade. And as the time went on, a man named Dr. Spock came around. And Dr. Spock told us something that was ludicrous, but we were so intelligent, we, was, we, we didn't know what we were doing. We, have you ever heard of being in, uh, educated beyond your intelligence? It is such a thing. Dr. Spock told us, you don't even have to discipline your children. Just let them grow. They'll, they'll grow up and they'll be just fine. Leave them alone. No discipline. And anybody that was a farmer back then, and most of us were in the woods anyway, where I lived anyway, we knew that if you planted a garden and you put down that perfect seed in that little line there and you put the strings on it and all that, and you put that thing out there, you know as I know, you would encourage it with fertilizer, you would encourage it with water, and you are trying your best to get your little seeds to grow. All of a sudden from somewhere, and God did it in the garden, Somewhere, weeds start coming up with a veracity that is out of this world. You didn't fertilize them. You didn't plant them. You didn't do anything to encourage them. And you can't get rid of them. And they'll choke out your seed. Now, yet and still, you can't grow a garden without attending to it. But you think you can let your children raise themselves. As a result of that, we ended up with a hippie movement in what we call the love era. When people were doing tie-dye and painting all of their clothes with all kinds of dye and and smoking all kinds of stuff and drinking the rest, they were doing some of everything. Free love, love everywhere, in the street, in the trees, in the woods, in the bushes, in the cars. Didn't make no difference who you was with. And somebody named the Isley Brothers came up and said, can't nobody tell you who to... Can't nobody tell you who to... Somebody was alive, y'all know somebody in here. Can't nobody tell you to who, what? Who the sock it to? <laughs> Dr. Spock got all that going. Now watch this. Them people were kids. They grew up and became senators and they became governors and all of that. And now they tell you, I can't tell you who to love. Where do you think that seed came from? And when children weren't getting anything from home because mama couldn't stay at home, mama had to go work. The kids were denied a good, encouraging, nurturing, spiritual, Christian home to build them up in. And we went out and the next thing you know, our children, they, they do what they do. When they're not given guidance and they're lost, they get frustrated and confused and they do things that anybody would do. They just do things. You have to give them guidance. I will never forget, I was in a meeting with a family, and the daughter, the girl was being taken from her family, and I'll never forget the charge she threw at her mother. Mom, you failed. You were never there for me. I was needing you, and you were too busy with her boyfriend to have any time for me. You didn't have no time for me, and you are the reason we're in here now. You're the reason our family is coming apart at the seam because you didn't do what a mother should do for her daughter. That's a bad taste. That's a bad feeling. But that's what's happened. Now we're trying to catch up. Look at our communities. Look what's happened. When you catch children young enough, you can keep them from getting on drugs. 
You can teach them how to avoid getting on drugs. Now, let me show you something else. I'm going to show you what women can do. Are you ready now? Are you ready? <laughs> Titus chapter 2. He's ready. Let's go. Read for me. No, you're not going to read Titus chapter 2. Hold on right there. Hold on right there. Titus says the women have a work to do. Yes. Correct? That's objective. Now, I'm going to show you what they can do because there seems to be some confusion. There seems to be some controversy and some uh, irregularities here. Watch this. There was a problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where the leadership's wives were stepping out of their area and started to do things that was causing confusion in the church. Now, this is the context. They were having trouble. The women were stepping out because Jesus liberated women, did he not? When Jesus said there's neither, when the Holy Spirit said there's neither male nor female, but all the one in Christ, they were liberated. They've come out, come out of the Hebrew culture a little bit because he's given them that opportunity to speak up. And now that they got an opportunity to speak up, they're speaking up. They're speaking out. And the Holy Spirit had Paul to correct them and tell them, now whatever kind of controversy you have with those people there in the class, ask your husband about it at home. Don't bring it up here and cause confusion in the church. If there is a concern you have, ask your husband at home. Are you listening to this? Mm -hmm. This is God's order. He's saying, I want the man to still be the one in charge of the home. To love her and to let her know, I can handle anything we need, honey, because we are one. I'm your husband. I'll take care of you. I'll do anything. Just let me know. You don't have to go in there and fight with those guys. I'll take care of that for you. I got you. I got you. So you ask me and I'll take care of this. You ain't got to go in there with them guys. Okay? Now watch this. Women had work in the church and they were very active. Go with me to Romans chapter 16 and verse number 1. Romans chapter 16 and verse number 1. I commend unto you. I commend unto you, Phoebe. Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at St. Crea. Crea. Now that watch ye, this. That ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints. Go ahead. And that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. Continue. For she hath been a success. Su Succor. Succor. Sorry about that. Of many and of myself also. Now what he just said when he said she has been a succor. Of me and many others also. He's saying she's been an assistant to me. Mm -hmm. She has helped me. Yeah. I am the Apostle Paul. Yeah. I'm not married, but I have assistance. Yeah. Phoebe is helping me. Mm -hmm. She's helped me, and I'm sending her to you. And I want her to help you like she's helped me. He did not say that she was a head of the church. He did not say she was a leader in the church. He said she was an assistant to him and a help in the church. And she was a help in the church. And she was so much so, I even believe she may have been a widow indeed. Because when she's a widow indeed, and if she's been this active in the church, she's supported by the church. And if you want to be supported by the church, he points out in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that the woman who is a widow indeed is one who has taken care of the saints. They have been give, giving people to hospitality. A whole list of things that qualifies her to say she is in fact worthy to be taken care of by the church. And if she's a young woman, leave her alone. She's going to want to get married. So don't put her in there. Let her go get married. And that's what he said to them. But she can work. She can do a lot of things. I want you to make sure that Phoebe keeps on doing what Phoebe been doing. A widow indeed was taken care of by the church. But they didn't just let anybody in there to be taken care of by the church. Because people will abuse things. And you know that. Nothing's changed under the sun. So they made it clear that there are qualifications for a widow in need. And that widow in need would be taken care of by the church. I don't know that she was. But it seems to suggest that. Because it seems like that's all she did. That's all she did. Eurodia and Synecdoche, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 2. These two women were now engaged in controversy with each other. They were having trouble. Paul says something. Anybody got that there? I beg you, therefore, brethren. Eurodia and Synecdoche. That they be of the same mind. Help 
those women. Who has done what with me? Labored with who? With me in the gospel. And with Clement also. And other fellow laborers. They've worked. They have worked. They have worked in the work of the Lord. I don't know if they're widows or not, but it seems that they are someone that's truly dedicated to the work of the Lord. Amen. They helped Paul, they helped Clement, and they helped others as laborers together with the Lord. Amen. Now watch this. How can this be? Is there a remote text to confirm what you're talking about, Hogan? Because I see you putting all this stuff together. Is there a remote text to say that anyone else had a husband and wife team or a man and woman team working together to the glory of God. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that. I don't know what to do. I'm so glad. You go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. I'll wait for you. Acts chapter 18. Go down to verse 24, please. We have Aquila and Priscilla, and I want to show you something here as we get into this. Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila's the man, Priscilla's the woman, okay? Aquila and Priscilla met a man named Apollos. Apollos was an Alexandrian teacher. He was great and strong, eloquent in speech. He was one who knew only the baptism of John. And he was teaching with all his heart the baptism of John. And Aquila and Priscilla ran upon him doing this. What does it say? In the book of Acts 18.24. And read. And a certain Jew. And a certain Jew. Named Apollos, Apollos. Born in Alexandria. Continue. An eloquent man. An eloquent man. And mighty in the scripture. Mighty in the scripture. Came to Ephesus. Mm -hmm. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. In the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit. Fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Continue. Knowing only the baptism of John. Knowing only the baptism of John. Now watch this. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard. A man and a woman heard. They took him unto them. They took him unto themselves. And expounded unto him and the they way. And expounded unto him. The way of God more perfectly. The way perfectly. of God more perfectly. They together did this. Just like Paul had Phoebe with him helping him do that. Just like Paul had Eurota and Seneca helping him to do that. They work with them. The responsibility was on the man, but the woman was there in support. And let's just point it out something here. God knew what he was doing when he made the man the man and the woman the woman. God is not confused. He's not confused. He knows what he's doing. God knows what he gave you, and when he made you, he gave you a gene. Ladies have a gene. Men have a gene. Let me show you. Men are goal-oriented. 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 Goal oriented. Men are goal oriented. Y'all gonna get this. Goal oriented. When he has something to do, he gets tunnel vision. I'm going to Tennessee. It's gonna take me eight hours to get there. And when I leave here, I got two kids in the back and a wife in the front. I'm gonna get there by 8.30, my brother. I'm going to ride like blazes. I'm going to get there. That's my goal. And I'm the man and I'm driving. But then there is the woman. She's multitask oriented. Multitask oriented. Multitask oriented. She can do seven things at the same time. She can juggle everything all day long. Multitask oriented. Multitask. Multitask. She can juggle. The man can't juggle, but she can juggle. So when they get on the road, Brother Harding, the baby's got to go to the bathroom. But all he's thinking about is, I got to get there at 830. <laughs> Ain't got no time to be pulling over. That'll make me lose time. And he'll rush everybody in there trying to get them back in the car before they even get out to get in the bathroom good because he's goal-oriented. <laughs> She's multitask-oriented. She can see the sign on the side of the road and say, you just missed our turn. <laughs> no, you did not. He ain't. To go 20 miles down the road and have to turn around and come back. Because <laughs> she's multitask oriented and he can't handle that. He doesn't want her to tell him that he missed the turn. Because he's goal oriented. You're going to make me not get there at 8.30. <laughs> and 
And where's the other child? They left him at the gas station. Because he wasn't going to wait. <laughs> God knows what he's doing when he puts us together. I've been married 45 years, well over half my life. Way over half my life. And I can tell you after 45 years, there are things my wife has said to me that's almost put me in the hospital. <laughs> because I didn't want to hear it. I honestly didn't want to hear it because I'm the man and I'm goal oriented and she comes up with details. I don't like details. I got a goal and that's all I want to hear about is the goal. Are y'all hearing this? But she's telling me, honey, there's some other things you got to think about here. I don't want to think about that. I want to get to my goal. I don't think I'm the only man that goes through this, but, but I don't like it always when she corrects me and tells me, you missed it, you missed it, you missed it. But that's what she was designed by God to do. She was designed by God to do that. When you learn how good a treasure that is, you are knowing for the first time how blessed you've been all this time. Yes. Women are a blessing. James Brown was right when he said, it's a man's world, but it ain't nothing but out a woman and a girl. Is that all right? Even James Brown can tell the truth. <laughs> Even James can tell the truth. But God's order is still in place. God's order is still in place. He's saying, I want you men to be men. And don't think of the woman as something to be shunned, disrespected, or even abused. Amen. She's the great treasure he gave you. She's your crowning jewel. She is your glory. That's the reason that the man buys the nice car, puts the woman in the nice car, he'll ride a moped to work, or bring up whatever, the bus or whatever, but he wants her to look good. And he puts her in the car, and then he goes out there, Brother McCall, and he tells her, that car show make, you show, no, no, let me get it right. You show, no, you show make that car look good. Because I know some brothers probably say, the, well, <laughs> get it right before you say it. When you put her in the car, she make the car look good. God don't make her look good, she make the car look good. That's the reason you put her in there, because she's an extension of you. And when they see her in that car that she's making look good, that made you look good. Yeah. That's when you give her your best. Yeah. That's when you put rings on her fingers. That's when you put necklaces on her. That's when you buy nice clothes for her, because when she look good, you look good. Yeah. I remember Brother Wash McCall, who once time was speaking in a congregation. I said, I don't know where we was at, but you were preaching. And you told us that somebody said they love their wife. Yeah. And you said, show it to me and I'll tell you whether or not you love her or not. <laughs> Did you say it? And that's the quote. Just let me see. I'll know if you love her. If you love her, it'll show. She looked like she just came in here and just barely got out of the wind tunnel. That ain't saying that she, that she that ain't saying too much. Everybody has a role. This is God's business. Nobody's disenfranchising ladies in the church. Your work is perfectly, terribly important. And let no devil tell you that you are insignificant and that you don't have significance. Never let that be said. Just because you're in the support role, that's the one that God gave you. And what would we be without the support? Don't take away from God's blessing. He gave us this blessing. He gave it to us. He gave it to us. He made the woman so she helped me. Means to do that which the man cannot do for himself. He can't replicate himself. He cannot even help himself in many respects. God gave the woman to the man as a blessing. Not as a curse. And she needs to be treated as a blessing. Pray to God that you learn how to appreciate your spouses. Pray to him and ask him to help you with it. Because the enemy is getting the world so confused now, it's hard to tell what a family is anymore. 
but God still got a plan for the family. It's still a man and it's still a woman. I'm not going to get into all the confusion that's happening now about these things with these uh, same-sex marriages. I'm not going to get into that. I have something else I have to go to. I want to take you to my third point, and that's God's greatest force known to mankind is love. Will you be known for loving, church? Will you be known for being a loving church? If this place, I said it last night, I say it again. If this building right here, which is called uh, 8837 St. Clair, the Church of Christ at the Boulevard, if it were not here anymore, if it were gone, after we've been here this many years, if it were gone, would we be missed? Yes, sir. And if we were missed, what would we be missed for? Yes, sir. What would they miss us for? Amen. Would they miss us for helping them in this community, building this community, reaching out in this community, trying to show our concern for this community? Or would they think of us as people who are standoffish, unconcerned, and self-contained? What would they think? Well, they think that we are people of God because they think our interactions between each other is so hostile, we seemingly don't have any care for each other. When Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, the same way he told the husband to love the wife as Christ loved the church, he's giving you a model. He says, love your wife as Christ loves the church. And he's sacrificial for her. He gives everything for her because he loves her. That's what a man does. That's a man's work. Yeah. You say, well, a woman can do it. Yes, but God won't judge a woman for being the head of the household. He'll judge the man for not being. Yeah. Now, if she's put in that situation where she's the matriarch of the household, that's another situation. She has to be what she has to be. But God's plan says the man should be able to take care of her. Yeah. And whatever she needs, he provides. He takes care of her. He protects her. He watches out for her. And if he has to do, he'll make the sacrifice. To make sure nothing can happen to her and their children. God said to us, I want you to love her like I love you. Now, how did he love you on your last mistake, your last error, your last failure, your last disaster? How did he love you? Did he just kick you to the curb? Did he kick you to the curb? Did he rebuke you sharply? Now, if you did something wrong, you deserve a chastening. You know you deserve it. Because the Lord loves people, and he loves those that he chastens. He chastens who he loves. A father that doesn't care enough about his child to discipline him doesn't love his child. And you say, what are you saying about that? Because when he sees the child going towards something that's going to cause him to be hurt or in danger, he stops him. Amen. And if he keeps on going, he has to do a little something to get him to recognize, I mean business here. Amen. I have little children, grandchildren. They run around, and one of them is notorious. And see, so, so you go up to him, and he's going to get on the table, and he starts messing with stuff, and he's looking to see if you're looking. He's messing with And you have to tell him, leave that alone. Yeah. He'll back up for a little bit, and he looks around to see if you're gone, and he come back again. You don't come back and say, I told you to leave that alone. That's when you touch him. Softly, but you touch him. 